Welcome to simplifying SQL Server migrations using PowerShell. What if your migrations happen more like this? You start with a fresh instance that has no operators, alerts, or jobs, uh, just the default logins, no databases, and then you execute a single command that specifies what you want to migrate and how you want to do it. You get up, you grab a cup of coffee, you talk to your coworkers, and then you come back to your desk to find that your migration is complete. I've actually done this a ton of times, and I used PowerShell to do it. My name is Chrissy Lemaire, and today I'll briefly introduce myself, and then I'll discuss why SQL Server migrations are sometimes necessary. I'll talk about what's usually migrated and the considerations that you have to make during a migration. I also cover a number of ways that SQL Server migrations are usually performed, and then I'll show you some PowerShell scripts that simplify the entire process. Now, I won't go into the code much, but you're more than welcome to download it and take a look and then tweet me or email me with any questions. So to introduce myself, uh, as I said before, my name is Chrissy Lemaire. I speak quickly and with a slight Cajun accent. I am a Microsoft PowerShell MVP and Senior Systems Engineer and DBA for GDIT at NATO Special Ops Headquarters in Belgium. I've worked with SQL Server since version 7 around 1999 and PowerShell since I was first introduced to it at the Los Angeles Professional Developers Conference in 2005. I am on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter. I mostly tweet about PowerShell, SQL Server, network security, and Belgian beer. I do have a blog at netnerds.net and a food recipe website at realcajunrecipes.com. So if you're looking for some gumbo or etouffee or beignets, we got it all there. So why are we even talking about this in the first place? Why do we sometimes have to migrate? The first reason that comes to mind for me are misconfigured SQL Server instances. You know, many of us will inherit SQL servers that weren't installed by a DBA. So you tend to get things like all the data, logs, all the backups going to just one disk. And I've actually inherited a SQL Server with a corrupt system database and a partially uninstalled SQL instance that couldn't even be removed unless I modified the registry. And so in cases like this, it's important to go away from these servers and onto properly configured ones. Another reason is consolidation. A lot of organizations are looking to reduce the number of servers that they're using, either because of an increase in licensing costs, especially with SQL Server 2012, or because of unmanaged server sprawl. Companies may also migrate because of a change in their high availability strategy, such as going from a failover cluster to always on, or alternatively, they may look to move from clustering to a standalone instance and then just manage their HA outside of SQL Server and Windows. Other reasons to migrate are resource requirements and best practices. Sometimes an application like SharePoint or System Center is going to want an entire instance all for itself. and if it's initially installed on a shared instance, then it would be necessary to migrate in order to follow the recommended practice. The last reason listed here are platform changes. Uh, when upgrading the OS or SQL Server, you can perform in-place upgrades, uh, but that's not ideal for every environment. And then there are also hardware upgrades, or going from physical to virtual platforms, or even moving to the cloud. So what do SQL Server DBAs usually migrate? In my experience, I usually migrate databases, logins, everything within the job server or SQL agent, like jobs and schedules. I also migrate reports within reporting services and then maintenance objects within the system databases, uh, things like Ola Hallengren's maintenance stored procedures. I'll migrate the server configs, uh, things like default compression for backups and enabling CLR, and to a lesser degree, all the stuff on the right. Although with credentials, they're becoming increasingly important because of their use within hybrid cloud implementations. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but they're all important things to think about when you're performing a migration. With login migrations, I'm only aware of two ways. And the first way, it's really hard to find positive things to say about it. Uh, I, it does maintain the SID, so I'll give it that, but otherwise, the SSIS transfer logins task changes the password, it disables the account, 
and it does not transfer server roles or server permission sets. I don't use this. Uh, with SP Help Rev login, it's way less painful, and I find that a lot of DBAs use this stored procedure as a starting point and then build on top of it because it maintains the passwords and the SIDs but it doesn't transfer over server roles or server permission sets. In addition, it's still really manual, so it doesn't scale well. And we'll take a look at an example migration using this method. So you're like, oh, I need to transfer this. Let me look on the web. I think I stored it somewhere. Oh yeah, it's on my GIST, GIST. And then you copy it and you go back to your source server. You paste it in, you execute it. Now you have to find the stored procedure and then execute that. Take the resulting data, copy it, paste it into your destination SQL server, and then there's always going to be an error. Um, it does work. The logins are brought over, but there has to be a better way than this. With migrating other stuff, um, there are a whole lot of things that SQL Server may need to be migrated. The two most challenging on this list are link servers and credentials. And this is because the passwords aren't actually stored within SQL Server itself. They're stored within this, the Windows registry and it's highly encrypted. And then there's the central management server. You know, I don't know about you, but my imports almost always go like this. So you're like, oh, I need to import something. And there's an import export feature. I'll export my file and go to the other server, try to import it and boom, an error. This happens whenever the destination SQL server CMS is located within the import.xml file. And so again, there has to be a better way to do this. And of course, PowerShell is that better way. You know, I used to dread migrating SQL Server, but now it's actually fun because I created a set of scripts that do it all for me. Uh, the first thing that I made was copy SQL Server logins. This works in SQL Server 2000 and above. It migrates both SQL Server logins and Windows logins within SQL Server. It preserves the SIDs, the passwords, the roles, everything that we had talked about earlier. The next script that I created was start SQL Server migration, which took a bulk of my time, um, especially because I was doing it at night at home within a lab and I tested it against about 14 different types of SQL servers because I wanted to ensure that it would work almost everywhere. And this particular script is now at over 2000 lines. So I'm just going to provide more details about it during the demonstration. As I was creating Start SQL Server Migration, I realized that even though auditing may be enabled on a SQL Server, it really doesn't provide a straightforward way uh, to gather just a simple inventory of all the hosts and logins and applications that log into SQL Server. So for peace of mind, I created Watch SQL DB Logins, which creates this simple inventory. Now, the resulting data isn't fancy. It's just a SQL table, but you can export the data into Excel, make a pretty pivot table, and then easily evaluate which applications will be impacted by your migrations and make sure that their connection strings are updated. I created a few others, and then I put it all on GitHub. In addition to GitHub, I also do publish to Microsoft Script Center, but that's generally reserved for more polished scripts. Uh, GitHub has most of the scripts that I wrote, plus all the ones on Script Center. Uh, the ones that didn't make it to Script Center yet either haven't been tested to my standards, or I'd still like to add more features. One of them that's on here that's not on Script Center is Restore Hallengren Backups. I've used this to restore an instance that I completely destroyed within my lab. So that's a super useful one, but it doesn't support every environment that everyone has, and I'd still like to add a lot. Now, these scripts aren't modules, and they're intended to work only as I've documented in the examples. I do have plans, though, to combine it all into a formal PowerShell package where you can consistently execute both the supporting functions within the script and the script as a whole. So I'm going to start by showing you around the demo environment, and then I'll start the actual migrations. Let's jump in and take a look at the demo environment. We're going to be going from SQL Server A, which is a standalone 2012 instance, to SQL Cluster, which is a clustered 2014 instance. It's pretty empty. It has just one database called Already Exists. 
some default logins, no credentials, no linked servers, uh, just one job, and no alerts, operators, or proxies. With SQL Server A, on the other hand, it's pretty stacked. It has about 1.2 gigs of databases, more logins. It has both Windows logins and SQL logins. It has a credential. It also has two linked servers and jobs with job schedules, as well as alerts, operators, and a proxy account. Now let's take a look around the registered servers. SQL Cluster is empty, while SQL Server A has a number of groups and subgroups. And now I'm actually going to migrate the central management server. I do rely heavily on CMS, so you'll find that a lot of my scripts support it. And the script that I'm about to run, copy SQL central management server, copies registered servers from one CMS to another. So first I'm going to set the source, which is SQL Server A, and the destination to SQL Cluster. Now, unlike import-export, it doesn't attempt to add the CMS to itself. It does, however, offer the switch server name parameter. And so if your source has the destination server name within the CMS list, then it's just going to change it around. You can also migrate one or more groups, and this is an auto-populated list that you can just tab through. But for now, we're going to migrate the entire thing. So there we have it. It did switch the server name uh, because we instructed it to. At least that's what it reported. Let's go and confirm. And there is everything. So you have the, uh, the switch server name. It not only copies over the server name, but the registered server name as well and the server description. Note that all of the scripts that I'm running today do require PowerShell 3 and above and SQL Server Management Objects, also known as SMO. And you can find the link to SMO both in these slides and then within the scripts themselves. So now that we've migrated the central management server, we're going to move to SQL Server credentials. But first, I'm going to do a little bit of house cleaning. Now, you may remember that SQL Server A had one credential. It has a username and password within it. And SQL Cluster had no credentials. Now we're going to use copy SQL Server credentials to copy over those credentials. <laughs> we're gonna, so we're going to put in the source, which is SQL Server A, and the destination, which is SQL Cluster. Now if I were to just press enter from here, then it would copy over everything. Or alternatively, you can specify which credentials you would like to migrate. This is auto-populated, so you could just tab through. Uh, when there are spaces, in the credential name, then you do have to enclose them in quotes. And now it's connecting to the remote registry service, so you have to make sure that that service is not only available through the firewall, uh, but turned on as well. So let's go ahead and check out the new credential. And there we have it username and password. Now because decrypting the password is such a challenge, the alternative to using PowerShell is pretty much to manually copy over each credential, but this way is so much better. And similarly, we can migrate linked servers with these and that's what we'll do next. Now if you've ever tried to migrate a linked server, uh, you know just how challenging it can be. Fortunately, Antti Rantasari from NetSPI created a PowerShell function that does perform the decryption of any embedded passwords. It uses a whole lot of math and cryptography, but I took that and I put it into my copy SQL link server script. So let's go ahead and migrate the link servers. We're going to take a look at SQL Server A which has two link servers. The first one is actually really straightforward to migrate because it doesn't have any embedded usernames or passwords. The second one, however, has a remote login and password associated with it. So first we're going to confirm that this uh, link server is available. It is. And the second one is as well, and it has a throwback to pubs and Northwind. And we're going to come here and see that there are no link servers. So let's go ahead and migrate that over. We're going to use copy SQL link servers. 
set the source to SQL Server 8 and the destination to SQL Cluster. Now if I were to just press enter again, it would copy over all, SQL, uh, all the link servers, but alternatively you can specify which link servers you would like to bring over and this is auto-populated by the source server. So you just tab and there we go. Copy over both of them. It's making the remote connection. Now it does migrate the passwords and it migrates only if the provider exists on the destination. It doesn't migrate ODBC connections yet or any of the drivers and it also doesn't copy over local files such as SQLite databases but it does perform an easy link server migration. Check this out. So they are both there. We're going to confirm. Um, now the server options are all copied over as well. And for this one, there it is, the remote login and its password. And again, we will confirm that this works. And there it is. And here's the challenging one. And there we have it, an easier way to migrate linked servers. Next up, we'll look at watch SQL DB logins, uh, but first I'm gonna do a quick cleanup. So I'm gonna refresh the SQL servers. And clear PowerShell. Now, as you may recall, watch SQL DB logins helps build an inventory of the logins, hosts, and programs and the databases that they connect to on the SQL servers that you're looking to migrate. I'm going to open up a script center page for it to grab some SQL code. This does have a sample screenshot, example usage, and the SQL syntax that I need. The, the SQL is also located within the PowerShell script itself. I will create the database on SQL cluster because it already exists on SQL Server A. I'm going to execute it. Now you may notice this. This is a cool technique that allows me to perform a bulk insert and if the result already exists then it just ignores it. And this keeps the code running quickly. If I recall it's as little as 400 milliseconds for several servers. So let's go back to PowerShell and perform a watch. I'm going to specify the database server, SQL cluster. I can also specify the database and table names, but I'm just going to keep them as default. And to populate the server list, you know, the list of servers that you want in inventory, you can either use CM server or servers from file. In this case, we're going to use the CM server. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so we're going to use SQL cluster. So it got 42 rows returned. Now, in the database, since it's set to ignore duplicates, whenever we look at the SQL table and the results, we may not necessarily see 42 rows. This script uses SQL Server process enumeration to track the logins of each server, and it's kind of a hack, but it's worked really well for me. I do plan to support SQL Server auditing in the future. Also, by default, it does ignore logins to system databases, so we're not gonna see any of those matches. So here we have a ton of results. I know that I would need to update my link server, you know, my SharePoint servers, etc. And we're going to run the watch again, and this time I expect to see my new connection to the WatchDB database. And there it is. So in my environment, I run watch SQL DB logins as a scheduled task every five minutes. Um, planning is important when you're watching your databases because it does take time to capture every login instance. And I found that in our environment, it took up to 48 hours to get a really good idea of the database login usage on each server. And now that we've seen a few basic migration scripts, we'll get into the more advanced ones, migrating logins and SQL Server instances. Let's start with logins. The first thing that we're gonna do is take a look at the logins on both of the servers. Refresh and refresh. So SQL Server A has a number of Windows logins and SQL logins, and SQL Cluster has far fewer. And now we're gonna use 
copy SQL Server logins to migrate the logins. Uh, this script supports all editions of SQL Server 2000 through 2014, and it migrates both SQL logins and Windows logins. So let's jump into it and take a look at a few parameters. The first, of course, we're going to specify the source, SQL Server A, and the destination SQL cluster. Now you can connect to the source and destination servers using both SQL authentication and Windows authentication, which is the default. Uh, this parameter allows you to connect using SQL authentication, as does this one. The sync only option only updates permissions and roles both at the server level and the database level. It doesn't add or drop logins. But speaking of dropping logins, uh, by default, the script will not overwrite logins that already exist at the destination unless you specify force. Force will drop and recreate the logins except for the one executing the script and the SQL service account login. Include logins, it'll only migrate the specified logins and it's also automatically populated by the logins on the source server. And we'll actually be using include logins shortly within the demo. Exclude logins will migrate all logins except for the ones specified. So let's see the script in action. We'll copy this complex password and then create a login on SQL Server A. Migrate me. Complex password. And we'll keep the password policies. We'll set the default database to watch DB logins and the default language to French. We'll pick the first four just because it's easier to differentiate. And the same goes for the user mapping. We'll select the first four. Initially, there are no securables, but the script does copy over securables. And let's set the status to disabled. So we're going to include logins, and I'm going to use tab completion. Migrate me, there it is. And there we have it. Um, it does migrate SIDS permission sets, roles, the default database, and other attributes. And if a user's default database doesn't exist on the destination, then it's just going to default to master. It doesn't currently detect related objects like agent jobs, uh, but I do plan to support that in the future. So let's go and look at the new user. There it is. So we have a complex password, the password policies, the default database, and default language are right. We also have the first four. User mapping, also the first four. And the status is disabled, but we will set it to enabled so that we can test the login. Paste the complex password, and there we have it. So now I'll actually perform a migration of all the users. The warning that just flew by was a notification that one of the destination default databases didn't exist, so it just changed it to master. As you can see, the SQL logins were added successfully, uh, as were the Windows users, and if any users already existed at the destination, they were not added. And there they are. So what if I did specify force? PowerShell will not take any action, but it will tell you what it would have done. So in this case, you can see that it would drop logins, it would add them back, and it would update each of their permissions. It would not do it to the login performing the migration or the login that is the service account. Now we're going to perform a sync only. And this again will not add or drop users. It's only going to sync the permissions at the server level and the database level.
And there we have it, a better way of migrating SQL Server logins. Next up, start SQL Server migration, but first I'm going to do a little cleanup. Start SQL Server Migration is an all-encompassing script that currently migrates one or more databases, including file groups, file streams, and full text indexes, one or more logins, all job server objects, all user objects and system databases, and server configuration settings. It supports SQL Server 2000 through 2014 and can perform a database migration using both backup and restore and detach and attach. And the rest of the details I'm just going to provide during the demo. So let's start first by looking at the parameters. Of course, we have source. We're going to set that to SQL Server A and destination, SQL cluster. So the first one is all logins. This will, of course, migrate all of the logins unless you specify exclude logins. Migrate job server brings over everything within SQL Server agent, including operators, jobs, job schedules, etc. Export SP configure will export all of the server configuration objects to an SQL file so that you can just execute it. Run SP configure will actually run the SP configure from the source to the destination. Migrate user objects and sysdbs. This goes and finds all the user objects, like if you created a table or a stored procedure within master, msdb, or the model. Detach and attach. If you're performing a database migration, this is one of the methods. And the next method is backup and restore. When you're performing a database migration, by default, it's going to put it into the default data and log directories. However, if you use reuse folder structure, then it'll copy over the folder structure exactly. So if you have you know, some secondary file groups on the F drive, then it'll copy it over to the F drive. It does check first to see if the same file structure exists. All user DBs, this is used in conjunction with backup and restore and detach and attach. And it will migrate all user databases unless you specify exclude DBs. Include support DBs will copy over databases like the distribution, report server, and SSI DB, but it doesn't actually perform a migration of those services yet that will be added later. Reattach its source. So if you are using the detach and attach method, you can specify reattach its source and once the migration is complete, then it will reattach the database. Network share is required when you're using backup and restore. And the network share has to be accessible by the service accounts running on both the source server and the destination server. Everything will copy over the databases, the logins, the job server objects, all user objects in system databases, and it's just going to export the server configuration settings. It's not going to actually execute it. Set source read only. If you're performing a database migration, you can set the databases to read only once the migration is complete. Use SQL login source allows you to use SQL authentication to connect to the source server and use SQL login destination does the same for the destination server. When migrating databases and logins, Force will drop and recreate any existing databases and logins. What if is a built-in PowerShell function that will just tell you what it would do as we've seen previously. Include DBs allows you to migrate only the specified databases. When used in conjunction with all user DBs, this parameter will allow you to skip the specified databases. Include logins will allow you to migrate over only the specified logins. When used in conjunction with all logins, exclude logins will allow you to just exclude the specified logins. Like the other include and exclude parameters, it is auto-populated so you can just tab through. And this is populated by the source. If you find that your include and exclude parameters aren't appearing, 
then you can just keep tabbing through all the parameters and they'll eventually appear. Sometimes it takes up to five seconds for these to appear completely populated, but then once they do, it's very quick to tab through all of them as you can see here. And this concludes the parameter introduction. Now we're gonna start with the migration. The first type of migration we're gonna start with is the backup and restore. So let's go ahead and set our parameters. Going to specify backup and restore. And then when you're using backup and restore, like I said earlier, you do need to specify a network share. So I'm gonna paste in my network share and if we go and we take a look at it here, there's nothing there. Now we have to specify what we wanna bring over and to make this as simple as possible, we're just gonna say everything. So let's do it. This is gonna run for about a minute or two you may have noticed the file server and SQL server connection check. When you run this script, it initially performs a lot of sanity checks. Is SMO available? Are all the required perimeters present? Is the account running this script an administrator on the SQL servers? Is somebody trying to run this on SQL Server 7? If you set the restore to reuse the folder structure, does that folder structure exist at the destination? If the attach and attach is specified, are the administrative shares that contain the database files reachable? And the list goes on. The point is, the script does a lot of heavy lifting to make sure that each migration goes properly. So back to the pretty colors on the screen. You can see that it shows you the start time, that it's backing up, it's restoring, it's setting the database owner, and then when it's finished. There's not a lot of frills here because it just works. There are actually more frills for the detach and attach, which we'll see soon. Next, we're about to see the logins fly by. There they went. The logins were all in white, and what you're seeing here in yellow and green are the job objects. With job objects, you can't specify which ones you want to migrate. It just brings them all over, and if they exist in the destination, then they don't write over them. That is something that I plan to enhance in the future. And now that it's copied over the user objects in the system databases and it's exported the spconfigure SQL file, the migration is complete. Let's go check out some of the files that it exported and then the databases on the destination server. As always, we will refresh and refresh. Um, so let's look at the databases and here they all are. Then we're going to go into the system databases to take a look and make sure that everything matches up. So here you can see that I have a number of stored procedures and this came from here. In addition, we have of course all of the logins but those were brought in before and then all of the job objects as well as the alerts, the operators, and the proxy. Now let's take a look at the file share where the backups were made to. Now of course all of the databases within this directory are small because it's for demonstration purposes only. However, I have used the script to backup and restore 500 gig databases. Also, something I forgot to mention earlier, the backup and restore does use a copy only database backup, so it doesn't mess with your chain at all. Now let's look at some of the logs that the script generated. The script has really basic logging functionality for now, but it does provide an easy way to see all of the changes that have been made. The log files are written to the current directory, and as you can see, the file name format is source to destination, timestamp, and then object impacted. Let's go ahead and look at one of the CSV files. You may recall seeing this information within the script itself, and basically what it does is it takes that output and then puts it into a CSV file. And the same goes for the logins as well. So let's go ahead and look at that.
And the same goes for each of the CSV files that were generated. Now let's take a look at the SQL files. With the SQL files, I did think that it was important to inform the DBA of the changes that had been made, especially whenever it comes to the changes made with SP configure and then the master and MSDB databases. So if I click on the SP configure file, you can see everything that was changed on the destination server. You can see all of the changes made here too. Again, this is really basic, but it's a good idea of what changes have occurred within your system. So now I'm going to do a quick cleanup and then perform a detach and attach migration. During this migration, we will be using set source read only, so I'd like to show you that the source is currently in writable mode. And now let's begin. Start SQL Server migration. Source is SQL Server A, destination is SQL Cluster. We will be performing a detach and attach on all the user databases. We will set the source read only and we'll also reattach at the source. We'll have to specify force because we did perform a previous migration and all of the databases are there. So force, and then let's throw in a login. Oops, let's throw in migrate me. Currently it's trying to contact the administrative shares on each of the servers. And now it's performing the migration. As this is flying by, you can see a few things. This includes uh, a notification that the database was dropped on the destination. Next, that read only was set to true on the source. Then the detach on the source was successful. Next, the files are being copied and then were successfully attached. Then the database on the source was set back to read only because this is one of the attributes that are lost whenever you're performing a detach and attach. And finally, the reattach was successful. A little more care always has to be given when you're performing a detach and attach migration because unlike backup and restore, databases that are part of a mirror or availability group, they have to be dropped from the mirror or the group prior to the migration. And this script will not drop that unless you specify force. Also, because some attributes are lost, they have to be put back. Uh, these include trustworthiness, broker enabled, ownership chaining, and then the read only status. The file copy method that I chose was a bits transfer because it does ensure that it gets to the destination at some point and it does use the highest priority bandwidth. This is actually one of my favorite parts. I like this database in particular because it has so many secondary files, but it just copies everything over and once it reaches the destination, it's going to work there. Detach and attach has to copy over white space, unlike backup and restore. So using this method does take a little longer. Oh, I also forgot to mention that the database owner is also maintained. And if the login doesn't exist on the destination, it'll just be changed to SA. Here you can see a larger log file being copied over. And there, we've successfully migrated using detach and attach. 
Let's go take a look at the source and you'll see that everything was set read only. There it is. And then the destination has all of the databases as well. And I'm going to go ahead and clean up before moving on to the next section. I've actually decided that I do want to sneak in a quick look at Restore Hallengren Backups because even if you don't use his scripts, you can still modify this script to suit your own environment. Start SQL Server Migration is very Windows domain dependent. If you aren't on a trusted domain, Backup and Restore can only be used as long as the file share is accessible by both of the servers and Detach and Attach relies entirely on Windows authentication to perform the file copies. Restore Hallengren Backups doesn't have this requirement because it just performs the restore from a file share. So let's quickly take a look at my file share. This is where all of my SQL servers are backed up to. Inside each of the directories, you have the database names and then the differentials, the fools, and the logs. If we look inside the log file directory, we see here that there are four log file backups. So let's go ahead and begin with a quick restore. First, we're going to go and accidentally drop all of our databases. And now we're going to put them back. Restore Hallengren backups. The server name is, of course, the name of the server that you're restoring to, SQL Cluster. The restore from directory is the directory that's on the file share that contains your backups. So that is SQL Backups, and then I'm going to select the instance that I would like to restore. Now this script can look inside of the backups and determine the previous folder structure and then reuse it, but in this case we're not going to use the parameter, we're just going to let it go to the default directories. With force, if a database exists on the file share and on the database server, it'll drop it first and then recreate it. Here's include dbs again. It is populated from the directory list, as is exclude dbs. And let's go ahead and exclude a database. And let's begin. So what this script does is it goes into the directory, it gets the most recent full backup, the most recent differential backup, and then all of the logs since the last fuller differential. So your database can be brought up to date until your very last log backup. This can also be a good script to use if you want to automate your restore testing. As this is restoring, let's go ahead and take a look at the databases over here. And there we go. As you may be able to see, the database owner is being changed to SA across the board. And this is because it's been argued that it's best practice. And also when you restore a database, the new owner is your username and it seems more appropriate to have SA as the database owner. And there we have it. You can see a list of all of the databases that were properly restored and then the one that was explicitly skipped. Let's look at the final results. And this is why I love PowerShell. Hopefully you're just as pumped. But now we got to go back to the slides. So I'm not actually going to review the scripts, but you can download this presentation and just take a look at your convenience. Resources. So I do have some PowerShell SMO recipes on my blog, so if you're looking to build your own scripts, they can help you get started. The SMO links are actually a little bit of a challenge to find on Microsoft's site, so I have provided direct links here. Now time for questions. Hello. All right, Chrissy. Hi. Great job. Thank you. You really do talk fast. <laughs> and with a thick accent. But maybe not as thick as yours. So if, uh, 
<laughs> Depends on if I've talked to my cousin recently. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please go ahead and throw them in the chat window right now. Um, Chrissy, if you want to just, while people are typing them in, uh, recap one of the ones that you answered uh, that you think is most important to call out. Uh, there were two. Uh, does this script take care of object per level permissions like table schema, stored procedures level, and level for migrating logins? Uh, with backup and restore, whenever you restore a database, it's going to bring over all of that, and this, then this script will copy over that information as well. And then the other one was, sorry, I'm going to try to slow down. Um, let's see. Can we just move the logins, which are newer, from the source to the destination? I didn't add that functionality. Uh, that is something that should be pretty easy. So I can go ahead and do that. But until then, you would just have to perform a migration. So let's say you want to do this on a scheduled task. You would just have it have two actions. The first action would perform the migration. And then the second action would perform the sync only. OK, so if you look, so somebody just asked, this is, you know, where can I download the slides and the scripts and what's your blog? So down at the bottom of this PowerPoint presentation that's currently on the screen, you can see the slides are at bit.ly slash SQL migration slides. My blog is netnerds.net. And then I'm also on Twitter at at CL. Okay. Uh, there's Not, a question about Steve. Right, DB Mail. That is something that's totally on my list. So it's planned for the future. It doesn't currently do it. I can actually answer the next question that came in, which does, does this work on a standalone instance of SQL Server? Absolutely. I've tested it out on my own machine uh, many times, and it's great for if you're spinning up a new version and trying to test out new features and just want to copy everything over. And I'm actually really glad that Aaron tested that because I only tested it in a domain environment. And so he did test it on the local. And I actually added back. There was something I had removed from the scripts because I didn't consider that. But I have added it back. So now it does work. Uh, Bit. On this one. So uh, Bits is actually what, what Microsoft uses when you're downloading your, your Windows updates. And I think it's called Background Intelligent Transfer Service. It's just, it's kind of like a file copy, but it actually ensures that at some point, let's say that there's, that your, your network connection drops, when it comes back up, it'll just continue, it'll restore that copy um, so that it'll eventually get there, even if there's an interruption at some point. I made these scripts particularly for my environment, but my environment isn't every environment. And I do want to make them so that they support a wide variety of environments. So if there's something that you do, then go ahead and contact me in some way and ask for that as a feature request. And then I can just go ahead and potentially add it to my script if it's feasible. We've still got five minutes left. If other, uh, more people want to get in some questions, we've got a few more minutes. Please do. No problem. My blog is at netnerds.net. The first uh, blog entry that you're going to see, my best friend is actually a DBA as well. He's super smart. Um, he has an entry there. And then I also, uh, he primarily blogs about uh, SQL Server. And then I primarily blog about PowerShell and SQL Server. So again, that's netnerds.net. And if you go to my Twitter, you can find the link there, too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Woo! I appreciate that, Amir. That was a... Um, might get us, uh, another question or two in here, but uh, in case we don't, just want to say that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, I've enjoyed uh, using the script and learning about it and testing it out and trying all kinds of scenarios. And I'm glad that you were able to share it with everyone so that more people can start giving their input to it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what things that we hadn't thought about uh, when we were doing testing just the other day. Exactly. Um, and if anybody finds any bugs, feel free to contact me. The moment that I see a bug, I do try to act on it as quickly as possible. And then I do update both GitHub and Script Center. That might just be um, everything we've got. I'm just going to see if I oh, can just throw up. You're welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much.
I'm going to see if I can um, share that code one more time since we've got a minute of uh, questions coming in. Um, hey, thank you so much for the input, Joe. That's really nice. I had actually contemplated that. And initially it was longer and uh, and then I presented this to my team and they said that it was a little short. shorter or it should be a little shorter and so I'm glad that the pace is perfect and thank you so much yeah. all right so uh, once again YouTube channel will get this posted up there uh, later today hopefully if all works out if all the uh, conversion gods are smiling on us um, we've got a um, Code, discount code for you to use in case you're looking to register at the past, for the past summit. It's BC15MBK7 asterisk, and it needs to be used by July 17th to get the price that you see on the screen, although I think the code should be uh, usable after that as well, just at a higher price point. And um, uh, again, Jim Christopher <clears throat> is going to be doing a presentation for us later this, uh, next week, next Friday actually, on stupid PowerShell tricks, which by the way, there a couple of them are awesome, especially the one with the clipboard. So definitely check that out and we'll get those posted as soon as possible. And Chrissy, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I know it's a, probably a little scary doing your uh, very first presentation <laughs> and having zero audience. Absolutely to, uh, terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I, I can't imagine doing it that way. But, thank you uh, so much for the thanks. opportunity. I really appreciate it.